Hey everybody, it's Rob Shear, the founder of Comfort Cases, and it is so hard to believe that we are on season five of Fostering Change. You know, we've had some great guests in the past, and this season we have some more great guests. So please make sure you go over to YouTube, subscribe, or you can always find us on any of the podcast platforms, and that's Fostering Change. You know, it's hard to believe that we are already in fall. You can feel the crisp air. And what I absolutely love is for those who know, we've got our benefit that's coming up at the end of September. And I'm so, so excited. Auction items are already going to start being seen online. And, you know, this is one of our biggest benefits for comfort cases. But what I really love is the fact that, you know what, we're back here again for another episode of Fostering Change. You know, this is hard to believe. It's our fifth season. Um, I am so, so proud of all my team and how we have done so much and these beautiful awards that, you know, my team has been able to win. But what I'm more proud of are my guests. The fact that I get to talk to some of the most amazing people, that I truly get to come into your radio or I come into your YouTube, and I truly get to help you understand what it is about being a good human. You know, the fact is, is whether you're a foster parent or maybe you're going through something else, the fact that we can all become a good human is what's so important. And my next guest, she is the definition of being a good human. You know, I actually found Laura a while back following her on social media, and I was just so intrigued. Um, there is nothing that I love more is when people put in content on social media and use it the right way. Now, make sure you understand that you all hear that. You know, we all hear these things about social media and how, you know, a taboo at times, but if you use social media in the way that it was built, in the way and the reason it was built, it can truly be a game changer for some people. And for my next guest, that's exactly what she's done. So ladies and gentlemen, those who are watching and listening, please welcome my friend Laura to Fostering Change. Laura, welcome. Thank you so much. That was such a sweet intro. I'm so excited to be here oh my and, gosh. and chat with you about important topics. You know what, Laura, I absolutely love the topics that you put out. You know, there are so many questions that I feel that people have when it comes to foster care. Um, There's so many misconceptions yes. um, when it comes to, you know, foster care. And, you know, for me, people know my story. You know, I started in the system. I've been in the system. I aged out of the system. I've adopted five beautiful children from the system. But, you know, to have somebody like you come into this and by the way correct me if I'm wrong you you literally walked into this blind on social media or as a foster parent as a foster parent yes I I did not have any lived experiences or any type of connection to foster care so yes it was a a starting from zero type situation and kind of hit the ground running <laughs> I think a lot wow. of people can can relate you it's your entire world changes so, so, you know, one of the things that when my husband and I became foster parents, one of the things that I really felt, um, and again, I'm, I'm ready for all your emails. I get them all the time, guys, when I get ready to say this, but I felt like there was zero support. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like, you know, you were literally thrown into the lion's den yeah. with, you know, some paperwork that truly did not give what you were getting into. Um, how was your experience? Experience like that because for my husband and I it was really rough yeah I think that was a huge shock for us you know we're taking care of someone else's children but given such little information about them and it was shocking that we're held to these extreme standards um without a lot of information about the kids and decent training I think the training is a good to start but as soon as you actually get have kids in your home you realize oh gosh I I need a lot more help. I need a lot more training and a lot more support. Um, but no, I remember, you know, kids being dropped off and, or me picking up kids with very little information and sometimes wrong information about them too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, let's talk about that because that happened to, to well, let me tell you something that happened to me um, as a kid, I came into the system and mm -hmm. I came in the system when I was 12 years old. When I was 16 is when um, my foster parents were finally able to get a copy of my birth certificate and found out that I had been celebrating my birthday on the wrong oh my day. 
it's you know, heartbreaking. And so, birthdays so, are so critical for kids. <laughs> so then we fast forward mm -hmm. and my daughter arrives 14 years ago. She's four years old. Social worker drops her off and says, please meet Maya, you know, and Makai. And we're given no information whatsoever. We ask, well, what's Makai's middle name? Well, we don't know. Or, what do you mean you don't mm -hmm. know? You know, so we're weeks into being foster parents, brand new foster parents. Yeah. Here's a little boy with special needs and a little four-year-old little girl. She comes home from school. Laura, she literally came home with a piece of paper and on the top of it, the name Amaya was written. And I said, mm -hmm. sweetie, I said, I said, the teacher gave you the wrong paper. I said, you know, this is Amaya's. I said, where's yours? I said, your name is Maya. And she looked at me and she said, Mr. Rob, my name's Amaya. Uh, and I said, uh, and she oh said, oh my gosh, my heart breaks for you. I know how you felt in that moment. Oh, <laughs> she said, my name is Amaya. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, sweetie, why have you allowed people to call you Maya? And she says, because that's just what they've been calling me. And I said, no, honey, your name is Amaya. And we will always call you that. Now I got a better one for you. Fast forward all the way to 2019. 2019. Yeah, just here, My just recently. Yeah. 18 year old son arrives. Mm -hmm. We get a copy of his birth certificate. Mind you, I have no idea why the other foster parents that he'd been with had never gotten a copy or why the social worker. They didn't ask. They didn't Nobody ask. looked at it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And come to find out, his birthday, which he had been celebrating it for 18 years on January the 6th, his birthday was actually January the 3rd. Mm, so, tough. Laura, what do you think about those? You know, it's it's hard because I, you know, having some time, some years to reflect, you know, being a foster parent, you can kind of see how that happened. It doesn't make it okay, but, you know, from the the point of being removed from your family, going through multiple homes, the cracks of child welfare are deep. And these things get pushed down further and further. And without knowing what questions to ask or without doing, doing certain types of advocacy, you don't uncover these things. And, you know, caseworkers are, and I'm not making excuses for anyone. Like this is totally unacceptable, by the way. But, you know, the, the restraints and, red tape and all the pressures it, it's happening and um the kids are the ones suffering it's not okay really you know we're the adults we should be able to figure this out and with so many people at those team meetings you know i've had team meetings with 15 people and um it can be incredibly frustrating and i will say that especially for new foster parents when they run into these incredibly frustrating and disappointing moments a lot of them want to quit yeah. And, um, you know, so anyone listening, if you're going to have these moments of, of frustration, but please power forward, you know, power through it. Cause I'm going to yeah. tell you something through all of it. I'm going to tell you something. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have changed, changed, mm -hmm. wouldn't have changed any of it. You know, as, as Reese would say, if we can change a child's life for just one day, we've impacted our entire community. Um, and I think that that is so, so important. You know, you talk about, you know, the fact that social workers and and how, you know, they they have such huge caseloads. And by the way, you know, I'm not making excuses for anybody, but mm -hmm. that's the way it's always been. You know, this know. is a this is an industry, and I don't care what anyone says, it's an industry that makes money on the backs of children. Yep. It truly, truly does. Because I'm telling you something, if Chick-fil-A can get that number of people through a line as quickly as they can, we can get the darn child welfare system working better than the way it works. It you is. Know? It's 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 crazy that, you know, it's these problems have existed and continue. It, it's kind of frustrating to talk in circles. You know, I will say we are seeing some places pop up and trying something different and trying new things. And tell me about you know, that. Tell me about that. What do you see? What are you seeing where that's popping up and things are changing? Do you see some ch or changes are trying to be made? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is we're seeing this in a lot of places are these agencies are coming in to support the counties. And in theory, it is an added level of eyes on a case and accountability. Now we know in states like Texas, there's a lot of things slipping through the cracks there. But, you know, where I am in California, I've definitely seen the benefits of having that added level of advocacy 
and checks and balances. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you have, you have states like Connecticut, um, that are making big changes. They have, you know, new people in charge and are, are trying to change the way that kids are identified. Their, their removal practices are changing. They're putting social workers in schools to help those mandated reporters really understand what they're doing, um, and fine tuning those skills. And so I think we're, we're seeing some things. Yeah. But it's too slow. It's I agree. too slow and it's not widespread. There aren't federal, there aren't a lot of federal policies and the ones that are put in place have too many loopholes. I agree. I, I agree a hundred percent with you on that, you know, mm -hmm. and hearing the states that you're talking about that we are seeing some changes, even in my state of Maryland, where I live, mm -hmm. you know, but the thing is, is it's a little too, it's a little too late and it's way, way too slow. Um, oh, yes. And, you yes. know, it's, it's ridiculous. And the fact that every single state does it differently yes. is the biggest mistake that we make you know oh. it's like I, I say the word neglect you know 64 percent of kids are in foster care because of the word neglect but neglect is defined differently in every single state yep it looks and feels and operates differently and it also it you know from my point of view it makes it very hard to create educational content that's you know far-reaching and can can be meaningful to a, a bigger audience but you know we have to come together and we have to, you know, find some ways from an, a federal level to make these sweeping changes that don't have all these loopholes, but, you know, it's, it is, you are so right. It is so different. And then, you know, we have kids that are being sent to other States because there's no space for them. And yeah. now we have this incredibly complex problem and it leads to kids getting lost and families not reunifying. Well, I mean, you look at the fact that right now, I mean, it's it's common fact that we have 20,000 kids in foster care right now who are unaccounted for, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah. That to me is, <laughs> I mean, seriously, I mean, yeah. written on their file is AWOL, which mm -hmm. by the way, I was in the military and AWOL means you deserted. Um, and by the way, these kids did not desert. They are mm -hmm. missing. They are missing. missing. And if you look at the, the factors of children who are trafficked, 80% of the children that are trafficked today are from the foster care system. Yeah. The foster care system. It's, you know? it's sickening. And, you know, we, I don't know how people, you know, you can't go to bed thinking about them every night. Mm -hmm. And um, you I'm know, like there, you. there's no excuse. There's no excuse. I mean, but what we're seeing is, kids aren't reporting missing because of confidentiality. You're, you know, you're not getting an Amber alert on your phone every time a, a child in foster care is missing. Why is that? Why? You know, hey, let me um, you. I, I share this story with you and I have not shared this story with, with many people. Um, and I haven't shared it publicly, but I'm going to share this story with you. I have a son who um, suffers from reactive attachment disorder mm -hmm. And um, he ran away. Um, and so when he ran away, um, he was picked up by the police and the police took him to child welfare. I'm going to tell you something right now. Mm -hmm. If that child was white, they would have brought him to my front door, like so many other kids who run away. Okay. But because of the color of the skin of my son, he was taken to child welfare. Mm -hmm. And it was then the the whole drama role that we had to go through. And it was just, and it was like, I couldn't believe this. I was like, mm -hmm. you know, here I have a child who has been diagnosed by a, a clinical doctor. What In is, treatment or getting therapy, I'm getting sure. Therapy, <laughs> getting therapy, you know, and instead you now traumatize him by taking him to child welfare because he ran away because he has rad. And it's just mm -hmm. like, this is the system that we continue to keep seeing breaking down. And again, I listen, for those who are listening, let me tell you something. There is nothing more rewarding as I was sitting just last night on the football field, watching my son catch that football. Um, it's a rewarding thing to be a parent. It is. So I don't want everybody to think this is all bad. And But, but, but I also, Laura, I'm a realist. Yes, you have to be. We got to talk about it. Yeah. Like if you don't, if we, I think too often in the marketing messages, we are painting, you know, foster care is cute and oh, foster to adopt. And let's, let's, you know, all this beauty 
and and there is there are so many beautiful moments of parenthood and caring mm-hmm. for kids but you know i i appreciate and it's one of the reasons why i enjoy listening to you is because you are real and let's be realistic about what's happening yeah. so and you know what let me tell you something i i have you know there's highs and there's lows and one of the mm-hmm. highs yesterday my my daughter my daughter amaya and my son makai's their bio mother you know she she texted me um last night and she was like hey she's like what are you guys doing oh you know over the weekend she's like i was thinking about coming up and spending the weekend i have a great relationship with her Good. Yeah. I mean, we have a, because it's possible. I, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, I, I tell people that it is possible. Mm-hmm. It is possible. And what it teaches our children is it teaches our children that we all fall at one time within our life. Mm-hmm. Okay. But it's up to us as a community to lift that person up. You know, one of the questions I have, Laura, is, you know, that I, I keep pondering on is, I mean, I, I already know foster care doesn't work first of all. Secondly, I think that where we make the biggest mistake is by allowing the nucleus of the family to be destroyed in the first place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, you know, when, you, when you're when you talking about 64% of kids coming in because of the word neglect. Now, again, let me tell you something. I'm not talking about black eyes and I'm not talking about kids who, you know, corporal punishment. I'm not talking, I'm talking about the neglect and the neglect all is that gray area yes. of mm-hmm. not able to pay for daycare so they had to leave the child at home mm-hmm. they didn't have enough food in the pantry so the kid went to school and said my mommy's not feeding me mm-hmm. um they 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 didn't have they weren't able to pay their electric so they've been without electric for a month I mean, those are the neglect reasons yes. that kids are coming yeah in. or just unstable housing Thanks i know where i am we, we see that a lot because finding places within a shelter that allows children is quite difficult. Um, So then why, then why we as a society pay a stranger money to take care of someone's child when if we would just give that family a lift? You know what I think we should do, Laura? I think we should start having foster families where Mm -hmm. a family goes into a family and stabilizes them. Yeah. Remove anybody. I think that there, and there are, I mean, I've seen like, for example, I've seen sober living facilities that have children that have case management and, you know, security on site, there's rules, guidelines. And I think, you know, when I, I have experienced that with a family and it really piqued my interest because it was, there was something to that, that felt way more stable and way, you know, way healthier than, um, you know, complete severing and removing because that's just a that's a whole other piece of trauma that has to now be be you know reconciled and repaired and so I do think that there is something you know we there are some organizations that will do will intervene earlier the problem is there's so much fear with social services which by the way is legitimate that you know people aren't as willing families aren't as willing to go to doctors because they're worried they're not going to seek out therapy. They're not going to seek out support because they're worried that, you know, in one minute, the, the kids are gone. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and I don't blame them for feeling that way. And I don't, I don't have the answer of how we repair that. I think right. that's, that's, yeah, a, I think that's that a big, I think big thing. Brush that <laughs> yeah. so bad that I don't even know if that could ever be repaired. I don't know. Um, you know, I, I, re- I really don't, you know, I, I look at the fact, you know, and again, I look at, and I can only go by my only experience of mm-hmm. and the experience of people that I, I've interviewed, but, you know, I, I sit down and talk with my kids bio mom and I'm like, this, she should have never lost her kids. Mm-hmm. I mean, simple as that. I mean, it's heartbreaking, you know, and it is, you know, you, you look 14 years later and I, 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 I'm so thankful that we have a great relationship and we have a great relationship with aunts and uncles and Good. my husband and I have really tried to instill that, but, but it's just sad that I felt like the system did exactly the opposite of what it was supposed to do. And then, I, then, you know, you look at these kids who are aging out you know, I mean, all of a sudden, you know, we come in in this white shiny horse and we are saving this child. But as soon as that kid turns of age, mm-hmm. it's like, bye. Oh, I, I, you know, I've had some of the kids I've cared for. Their parents were former foster youth and, you know, we failed them. To me, when that happens, it we failed, you know, 
yeah. th- there are kids just like all the babies and toddlers and all the ages that we care for. They're just as, as fragile and as important. And we, we should be wrapping our arms with nurturing care around them. Mm-hmm. I agree. Um, you know, there's this new concept that I've been hearing more and more that people are talking about instead of, you know, mandated reporting, we have mandated supporting. Oh, I love Did I say that. that right. Reporting instead of, and then supporting. <laughs> um, I love yeah. that. Look, you should look it up. Um, and I'd be curious, you know, for, for our next conversation, what you think, but this idea of how, what, what should the action, what's the step that we're taking instead of just making a phone call? Yes. Those things are important. Kids need to be removed from unsafe situations, but what, what should we as community members or as bigger entities, like our schools, our doctors, what's the support that should right. be required in those moments to continue to wrap our arms around our community members, our neighbors? Yeah. Yeah. I, I truly do believe that same thing. I truly believe that, you know, we, we should be stepping in before that happens. You know, one of the other questions that I have for you, and I can't believe this time has gone by so fast. I could just talk with you all <laughs> day. And it's same, so, same. Every time I look, I'm just like, I can't believe we've talked to this long. But one of the things that I really, one of the things that's, that struggles my my heart is the fact of reunification. I, I truly believe in reunification, yeah. but I believe that that with the whole Family First Act, and again, all the emails are going to come, uh, that we, we're seeing, and we it's been documented, we're seeing the boomerang kids. Mm-hmm. And these are kids who are coming back and back into the system, out and in and out. Yeah. It, where do we, you know, I think there just comes a point where uh, we have to be adults. And if you cannot adult and be the parent, it's not fair. I mean, that I think that's just as much traumatizing as a kid coming into the system. Yeah. Well, and they lose hope in adults through all of it as well. You know, there's so much, there's so much promise when a kid enters care. And then when a kid leaves care, there's so much promise. And if we're not fulfilling those promises, it's just incredibly damaging to children and their families. Yeah, I, I think agree. that there's, there's a lot of steps that I think we can take, and I, it, it goes back to support. How can we support these families after reunification um, that is supportive, not e- removals? Right. Um, you know, I've seen some courts doing extended like transition plans or extended stays where kids are doing a 14 day stay or a 30 day stay with their parents as, you know, just kind of not a, a trial period is, I don't love that term. I got to think of a better one for that, but it ensures that the foster parents still engaged and helping. Right. It ensures the case management team is still there to support. Maybe that will help. I don't know. Time will tell. You know, I, I truly think that, you know, some of the things that we could change immediately is, you know, when, when parents have, you know, one hour visitation a week, <laughs> Um, supervised. That's BS to me. That's total BS. You know, you're breaking bonds by that one hour. I think we should, we should be able to allow, and my husband and I actually, we petitioned the court Mm -hmm. to allow us to be um, licensed supervising because we wanted the birth parents to to be able to see their kids call, Hey, on a Saturday, you want to go to the park with us? You want to, you know, I mean, it didn't work for us because they ended up not taking advantage of that but you know I think but the option option being there absolutely I think that needs to change yeah and I think that you know the more that we can lean in and be partners through all of this with our families can help of course you are not that is not going to be suited for all family units but but that shouldn't be the reason to not try right not everybody likes broccoli okay yeah exactly (laughs) we should at least be making some attempts and I think you know there are visitation centers that are changing they're trying to have kitchens and dining areas and playgrounds like so it is a little bit more nurturing but again as we said at the very beginning of the conversation it's so little yeah yeah you know everyone's celebrating these small wins and i don't want to discount them because we need the small wins but we need sweeping changes we need sweeping changes i agree with you and i truly do believe that one of the things that we should do and i you and i've had this with the exact thing i think think we talked about this before where i think everybody needs to come to the table i think that that this whole everybody disconnected you got your guardian light them over here your casa over here you got the parents over 
over here. You got the foster parents over here, the social workers back there. And there's the kid sitting in the middle of the table saying, what the hell do I do? Mm-hmm. What I think needs to happen is everybody comes to the table and they say, now, what is the best for this child? And how can we get the best for the parents. And I think that if we would stop with this, you're the foster parent, you're the parent and you're separated instead of, listen, you know, I I want you to have your kid back. You know, I want you to have your kid back. So let me help you. You know, you need you need a drive, you need a ride to to drug treatment. I'm I'm gonna take you. I'm gonna stand there. That to me is what I really am hoping that we will see when it comes to change. Yeah. And the research supports that. We have talked about this. These ice icebreaker sessions and these ongoing family meetings can make a, I've seen it happen to me personally, you know, I've participated in those meetings and it can make a significant difference on the family and the child. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe we'll see a lower statistic of kids in our juvenile detention centers and a higher statistics of kids graduating from high school within our system, because the numbers that we have been delivered just recently are absolutely heartbreaking mm-hmm. and you know as and we'll end this by saying nelson mandela said it you judge your society on the way you treat your children mm-hmm. on the way you treat your children and so if you just look here in the united states of america how we treat our children that are in a foster care system we failed listen laura it has been an amazing conversation i thank you for having me (laughs) oh my gosh you are coming back my friend you are coming back (laughs) we have so much more to talk about listen everybody you know um do me a big favor you know go out there and really share some love and really educate yourself because if in your heart you're even thinking thinking about becoming a foster parent you've already made the first step and that's say it's me. only going to grow from there. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It will only grow from there. This is another episode of Fostering Change. I hope you got as much out of it as I did. I did. Please, yes. You know, make sure you spread the love, share this, and um, we'll talk again next time. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to Fostering Change. You can actually watch a couple of episodes right here. 